selfie video. I will, I will do the mic thing because why not? So I'm going to be talking about this thing called communities. It's a big thing here in the Web3 world. And funny thing is, is that I've been doing community for quite some time. I'm really passionate about it. And why is it that I'm so passionate about this topic? It's not only because I've been a developer, I've been a founder of a tech company, uh, I've been a heavy metal guitarist, but I've also been a consummate community builder over the past 15 years, building, growing, and scaling communities of all different types, from technical to professional. And so I want to take us on a little bit of a journey around what it means to build a community. And you may be expecting me to talk about things like DAOs and treasuries and tokens and different platforms to scale and build your community on, but I want to actually get a little bit deeper and talk about fundamentals. These are great tactics, and tactics are important but they're not all that useful unless you have a strong foundation. And so the beginning of setting up this, found, this foundation of building a strong community starts with thinking about what is a community? We should have a set definition. And the working definition that I've used over the years is bringing or gathering a group of people together with shared interests, shared values for a shared purpose. And so I'm going to talk about what it takes to build up those foundation and all the elements that go into a strategic view into building a strong core for your community, for your Web3 project and startup. But first, let me talk about a few stories about how I got it very wrong over the past 15 years. So trust, it's so important. And we've seen in the Web3 space that sometimes trust has been very malleable. Rug pulls, fraud, a lot of very negative things that have destroyed trust in these nascent communities. So trust is that currency. It's a glue that brings people together. And I saw this very close and very viscerally when I was at Stack Overflow. Who here has heard of Stack Overflow, by the way? All right, there's a few builders out there. Thank you. Uh, love Stack Overflow. I was there to build up their SaaS business. And one day, I got this notice that we made a change in our code of conduct. One of our moderators had some very pointed questions about the code of conduct. Next thing I know, she gets fired from her moderator role for speaking up. And that caused a huge rift in the moderator community. The community actually manages all of Stack Overflow. And it caused irreparable harm. Many moderators left. It caused chaos in terms of moderating the site because if you can imagine, there's millions of people on the site every single day. Trust is critical. Make sure you are creating transparency in your project. I'm a numbers guy. I work at Amazon. We love numbers. We're very data-driven. But sometimes you can be focused on the wrong numbers. When I was launching this enterprise sales community, a community I launched for founders, salespeople, sales leaders, around how to learn and get better techniques and strategies around selling into businesses. So my very first chapter, New York City chapter, got to 1,000 members. I was super excited. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do an email blast. We are at 1,000. One of the folks in the community reached back out and said, you know what, Mark, that's great. What does it mean for me? It hit me like a ton of bricks. He's right. These are vanity metrics. They don't matter for the community, what matters for them is the value that they're getting out of the community. And so it reoriented my thinking towards thinking about what are metrics that are trackable, that I can measure, that are providing business outcomes, something that's a specific outcome that's value to the community and growing the community in a much more holistic way. And I get fixated on numbers. We all do. We love big numbers, right? But we also think that everyone should be involved in our project equally. And that's just not the case. And I would get so upset when I do a call for volunteers or people to be involved, saying, hey, you should be involved. We're all into this, in this together. Well, the reality is not everyone feels the same way. People get involved at the level that they feel comfortable in terms of committing. And I made this mistake not trusting my key volunteers to be those advocates. Instead of me making the call all the time, in 
fact, I let them make the call eventually, and they were much more effective in bringing on new folks to volunteer and be committed to the community. But sometimes these, these people, these fans that are super committed to what you're doing, they love your vision, sometimes they may be people that you don't expect. They don't look or feel like how you do things. And that could be a huge bias. In fact, when I was scaling out the enterprise sales form, I had this one lady, older lady, I didn't really get her vibe, to be honest. But she would go to every single event. She even went out to events in different cities to help out of her own volition. And over time, this became a really trusted, not only community member and leader, but a friend. So don't be, don't have any biases towards the people that are coming to you that want to be involved in your project. Take all the quirky, weirdo, strange folks, because those are folks that love your vision, and they'll be with you to the end. Now, what was great about this lady who was super involved was she was actually a doer. She'd roll up her sleeves, and she would do check-ins. She would do, like, she would help me with emails, all sorts of th stuff. And you want people that want to do stuff and be part participants in your community. But some people like to talk about wanting to be involved. They give a good talk, but they don't really do much. I had someone in Seattle reach out to me saying, I want to be your Seattle chapter leader. I want to get this going. I have a huge network. I was like, cool, let's make it happen. One month goes by, nothing. Two months goes by, nothing. So I called him up, said, hey, buddy, what's going on? We should get something going. He said, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just waiting, waiting out just to make it a big, huge splash. It's going to be epic. I'm like, OK. I'm, I'm cool with Epic. Let's see, let's see this happen. Three months go by, nothing. So I dropped him. He calls me back. He's like, hey, Mark, like, what's going on? I thought we were, I thought we were best friends. We're, we're going to make this happen right in Seattle. It's like, bro, you got nothing going on. I've given you three months. It's been all talk. Where's this Epic launch? Funny enough, a month later, someone actually steps up. This lady, she takes ownership of the chapter. And we have a great first event. It becomes one of our strongest chapters. So have people that want to roll up their sleeves, not people that just want to talk a lot. But also, part of the, the challenge, though, is if you're the one who's starting the project, you're getting your startup running, you're building this community, right? It's super exciting. You want to be involved in everything, but you can't be involved in everything because you can't be everywhere all the time. Your time is precious. So you've got to be able to delegate. Don't be a superhero. Don't try to do it all on yourself. When I was launching my own communities, I thought I had to be there on the ground with every chapter launch. Mind you, the, this community I was creating, the Enterprise Sales Forum, was 24 chapters around the globe, from Singapore to London. We were running monthly events. There was no way I was physically going to be at these places. I felt I had to be, until one of my chapter leaders took me aside and said, hey, we got it covered. Trust the people in your community. Don't try to do everything. But at the same time, some people will leave because people are busy. Motivations change. Life happens. And you've got to be okay with saying goodbye to folks that, for genuine, honest reasons, they have to move on. And that's the nature of community. People have different motivations. And in fact, this was something that was hard for me at first, but then I realized because you enable trust, because you give agency to people that are your fans, your leaders in this community, that it's okay because they will ensure that others come into the fold to take their place. And that's what happened in many of our leading chapters in places like Toronto and London and Chicago. Good people will come in because they love the vision. Well, that would actually say burnout if it wasn't all in white, but <laughs> the interesting things that happen when you transfer uh, PowerPoint decks to different systems, but one of the things I recognize in myself, as well as with a lot of the volunteers, that the reason people tend to not continue on is because people get burned out. It's a lot of work. Building a community is hard. Holy crap. So you got to give space for folks to take a break. And that was even something true of myself when I had this enterprise sales forum, 30,000 members around the globe. I had this role I was taking on Stack Overflow to build a new business from the ground up. Plus, I was starting another community called DevBizOps for engineering leaders. Three big things. Something had to drop, so I put the enterprise sales forum in the hands of very capable people to lead the way. 
So, but I definitely felt the burn. So give, your spell, give yourself the space to take a rest. I'm also very much a big believer in the power of diversity. A lot of our communities kind of look like ourselves. And that's probably not the most healthy thing. I think a community that is inclusive and brings in people of different ideas and backgrounds is a, fa is a powerful force. But you've got to be intentional about it. When I had one of my early meetups, I looked around and I said, whoa, there's five ladies here and there's 95 men. That's kind of awkward. Next month, we launched an initiative called Women in Sales Month. Every one of our chapters, we focused on women sales leaders as our speakers. Over time, in the course of, I'd say, about like five to six months, that ratio went from five to 100 to 40 to 100 because I was intentional. So be intentional about building diversity early on as you're building out the community. And lastly, even in the Web3 space, you may say, hey, I don't have any user data. I'm cool. It's all decentralized. Well, we all know that there's some uh, bad actors out there that are trying to get into projects, trying to make noise, trying to disrupt, trying to steal data. And that happens all the time, Web2 world, Web3 world. You're the community leader. You're the one who's building out the project. You need to ensure the privacy and safety of your community. And when it doesn't happen, those bad things eviscerate trust. And remember, I talked about trust at the very beginning. Make sure you keep the trust of your community at all times. So give you a little bit of warning. I'm going to drop some knowledge really quickly. Uh, feel free to take pictures of slides if you can't capture stuff quickly. So the very first thing is to ask yourself, are you building a community? Oftentimes, people say, I'm building a community. This is great. We're all in it together. Well, really, it feels more like a financial transaction. It's an audience. You're just selling tokens. That's not a community. That's a very low-lying need. Maslow's hierarchy needs say, that's OK. But in order to create stickiness and real engagement, real commitment, you need to think about reaching up to higher levels of act actualization. So are you able to create community through connections and relationships that you foster in this community? Are you able to build in recognition? Is there self-actualization? Think about different tiers and ways that you can you can connect to people's higher level motivations to create greater engagement and involvement. Uh, again, a little bit of a slide translation thing here, but the power of communities is that it actually functions as a force multiplier. And what do I mean by force multiplier? Well, if you connect two things together, okay, that's interesting, that's a conversation, or that's two computers talking together, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand. What if you put a billion computers together? What do you get? You got the internet. That's a crazy value. And the same happens with communities. But only if you get people talking to each other and connected, not as siloed individuals. So think about ways that you can bring people in groups together to engage and be involved in an active way as participants. I talked about this idea of true fans before. There was, there was a really great blog post called A Thousand True Fans, uh, written over a decade ago, that talked about uh, artists and how artists don't need millions of fans, they just need a thousand. Because that thousand is enough to survive and have a, have a pretty good career from an economic standpoint. Same works for communities. You have those true fans. And sometimes it may be a small band, but it's a superpower to have people that are committed to your vision around your Web3 project, right? But remember, not everyone's going to be engaged. There's participation and equality. So only generally 1% will be truly, truly deep into the weeds in what you're doing. But those true believers, they're going to activate others to be involved. They're your advocates inside and outside the community. A lot of you will go whole hog. I'm going, to, I'm going to build a great community. OK, well, how are you going to do that? Do you have a plan? Do you have a strategy? What's your framework? I'm a big framework guy because I think it provides a good mental model to get all the things in place in order to do things effectively, to do things in a way that makes sense, that are interlocked. So over time, with all the communities I've either built, supported, advised for, various Web3 projects that I've been involved with at the get-go, I've laid out seven key ideas as a framework to think about building communities. So the very first one is define the why. You'd be amazed how many people 
think about the why from their perspective. But why would people want to participate in your community? What's their why? What's their motivation? Map it out. Figure out, well, what's the incentive? If it's just a token, is that enough? You've got to create value up front. People got to see what it is that they're getting involved into. What's the white paper? What's the assets? Who are the people? Make sure people know what they're getting into up front so they can understand what's the value in for them. Then, once you do have people in the fold, make it easy to contribute. Not everyone's going to, going to contribute in the same way. It just doesn't happen that way. People get committed and involved in a way that makes sense within their own framework of all the activities and things that they have to do in their own lives. So find different pathways and mechanisms for people to get involved beyond just buying a token. And then rally those fans. That is your way of activating the community inside, getting people that may not be so involved to become involved, as well as getting people outside the community involved in spreading the word about the project. Those are your true evangelists. And if they're evangelized and they're contributing, they're doing some really good things in activating the community within your Discord or Telegram channels, well, that's great. Recognize it. Elevate them. Share what good looks like in the community so other people can follow on. And then incentivize them. Maybe it's through different economics, through your token. Maybe it's through other incentives. Be creative. But make sure you provide those rewards, those incentives. And then lastly, don't put all the work upon yourself to try and promote the community. Bring in influencers. Invite them in. Get them to see what you're doing in the project and let them help promote this goodness that you're creating. Now, everyone thinks, okay, I'm going to launch this community, and then I'm going to launch it to the world. This is great. Everyone's going to see it. It doesn't work that way. You're going to end up with the empty, the empty party effect, where people walk in, they're like, who's here? And then you walk out. I see that happen with a lot of communities. Think about a more strategic approach. There's a principle called the 550, 500, 5,000 principle, which provides a stepwise way of thinking about the magnitudes of how you scale your community. So start, start small. Start with those true believers, those people that get your vision, that, that say they want to be involved. It doesn't have to be a big group, but use them as the corpus to understand what are the, what are the motions of your community? What is value that's being created? What are the norms around participation and engagement? And then start to open up to similar cohorts and start to measure, iterate, expand, and once you have enough data, once you get a better understanding of the motions of the community and the economics of the community, then you can branch out to a bigger, wider audience. And you have something that people then, when they walk into this community, say, wow, this is a place I want to hang out at. This is a happening party, not the empty party. And this creates a lot of great momentum. How do you sustain that momentum? I think about things from a flywheel perspective in terms of building sustainable, long-term, healthy businesses. And this community flywheel starts with thinking about content, the stuff, the thing that people value, that they can grasp onto. It might be the discussion or knowledge that's shared in a community board. It may be the events, maybe like the people and discussion and events, whatever it is. That's what people kind of tie, tie themselves to and, and understand what's valuable for them. That's the value of creation. But then, there's events. This is, these are activations. These are moments in time where you can start to bring the community together and people from outside the community. And then, when they are together at these events, how do they talk about all the awesome things that they have seen and been involved with? Those are the connections. And that's the stickiness that happens that creates long-term engagement within the community. That's the glue. And once these people are engaged, They'll want to contribute content. They'll want to be involved in events. And if that happens, folks, you have a flywheel. You have a community which is going to last. So there's a lot to talk about in the context of 20 minutes. I can't get to all the things or all the ideas, but hopefully this gives you at least a little bit to work on. I do have a book that I wrote called Community in a Box. I have a few copies with me. If you want to chat afterwards and you ask me a good question, I can give you a book, but you can also get this book on your favorite online booksellers. And uh, I just want to preface that this is really just an, an opportunity to, to have ideas, to think about the strategies to help employ 
growth in your communities, give you a framework to work from. There's many different ideas, but focus on strategies first, tactics after. So this has been awesome. I'm super grateful to be here and have this time and opportunity here at Avalanche Summit. Uh, this has been an amazing experience. It's been my first, quite frankly, and I've been blown away just with the conversations and this community that, that Gun and John Wu have created. It's been amazing to see just the collaboration which is happening. If you wish to continue on the conversation here or elsewhere, scan the QR code, connect on the socials. We'd be glad to talk more. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Woo!